Well, good evening and welcome everyone. My name's Trevor Moore and I am chair of My Death, My Decision. Uh, I know you're absolutely as keen as I am to hear from Henry Marsh, uh, as I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating discussion. I just wanted to tell you in advance that there is a worldwide Zoom problem at the moment, uh, not unique to us, and we're relieved that we've been able to set this up, but unfortunately, um, the ability to draw up audience participants as panelists to ask direct questions to Henry is not currently functioning. Uh, so we'll uh, proceed with the conversation, but um, questions that were wanting to be placed by audience members will be read out rather than being able to bring you up as uh, visible participants as uh, the three of us are at the moment. Before I introduce you to Henry, I just wanted to say a few words about My Death, My Decision, because I know many of you are joining us for the first time and you may not know what it is that uh, drives our campaign. Um, we're a not-for-profit organisation that campaigns to change the law in England and Wales to allow assisted dying for both the incurably suffering and the terminally ill. But of course, it's not a campaign that's uh, just an abstraction. It's driven by compassion for people who would like to be able to avail themselves of such a law but can't currently do so in this jurisdiction. Uh, it brings to mind our patron and committed campaigner Paul Lamb uh, and Phil Newby too. And of course who can forget the brave uh, Tony Nicholson with locked-in syndrome who led a case in the Supreme Court in fact, last Saturday, the 22nd of August, was the eighth anniversary of Tony's death. And uh, much has changed in the interim. Uh, public opinion is overwhelmingly in favor of an assisted dying law. And the introduction of the law in Canada in 2016 now acts as a touchstone for our campaign uh, to embrace a look within a law uh, those who are both incurably suffering and uh, terminally ill. Now one of our members said that we punch above our weight. We are run mostly by volunteers including our eight executive board members and a team of enthusiastic and committed volunteers. We also have some generous donors who funded our campaigns and communications work and recently uh, have funded uh, an increase in our social media presence. But of course, we still need substantial funding to be able to achieve our ambitions for more human resources and to propel the initiatives that we currently have. So if you're not a member or supporter of My Death, My Decision already, I'd encourage you to uh, go to our website. The link will appear in the chat. Um, if it doesn't appear there, just search My Death, My Decision and it will come up and there's a join and donate button. And if you're a member already, perhaps you'll feel minded to make a donation if you can. Uh, we really appreciate it, so thank you very much. So a couple of practical things. Uh, we will be running for an hour this evening. The event will be recorded, so we will send the link round to everyone um, subsequently. And if you're not familiar with uh, the Zoom webinar format, if you have your cursor inside the screen um, at the bottom you will see a chat button where you can interact during the discussion and also a question and answer button where you can submit questions. We've had lots of questions submitted in advance uh, and we will also look at what's happening on the question and answer panel uh, during the course of the event. I dare say we won't be able to get through all of the questions so apologies in advance to anyone whose question we don't get the um, the, the chance to answer. But now um, it is really a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Henry Marsh. I feel I know Henry rather well because I've read both of his bestsellers, uh, Do No Harm and Admissions, and they're absolutely compelling, not just because you get insights into what it's like to be a neurosurgeon, uh, but also because Henry is incredibly candid and honest about his own life story, and it really draws you in. And he's going to be in conversation with our uh, social media coordinator, Sarah Sholdevik. Sarah worked on a campaign in Norway on assisted dying, and she's now helping us to increase our reach. So I'd like to hand over to Sarah now uh, and speak to you later. 
Hi, uh, thank you so much, Trevor, and uh, hi, Henry. Um, hi, hello. Hi. <laughs> I would like to start off with something brought up in your captivating books, where you often talk about how you were working with minuscule margins for error and knew that sometimes even the best performed operations wouldn't enable someone to fully recover. I wonder if you could tell me a bit more about how you managed that knowledge and your patients' expectations. There's no, there's no easy, straightforward answer to that. Um, in theory, with all difficult medical decisions, you discuss it openly with the patient and equally importantly the family, and you make a sort of joint decision together. But human nature being what it is, it's often actually very difficult for both the doctor and the patients to be really to really face up to reality. I'm, I have a problem at the moment, I'm retired from working in this country, but a very good friend of mine has recently been diagnosed with a, with a fatal brain tumour. Now, my experience of that particular sort of tumour is that treatment, which would take the form of several weeks of radiotherapy, doesn't really achieve very much. In fact, it doesn't in somebody his age. The evidence is pretty clear. It makes no difference and you waste several weeks having unpleasant treatment. And I faced the problem of do I tell him and more importantly his wife, it's a second marriage, he has a young child and his wife is young. Do I tell them that actually, I think treatment is a waste of time or a mistake? And I found it impossible to do that because it's so difficult to deprive people of hope, even if it's false hope. I, I always tried to be very honest in my practice, but it can be very difficult. Um, so when you have conversations of this sort with, with patients, with their families, about you know when it's very difficult to know whether treatment is any better than letting nature take its course, you know, I would enter these conversations without knowing what the answer would be. Because um, it depends on all sorts of very complicated factors. But the idea that we can all stare, look, look our death in the face and make a rational decision in the face of it is, is, is false. It's not like that. But having said that, you know, I, I feel passionately that we should have assisted dying in this country. Because um, I think it really goes back to the paradox. First point, in fact, by Lord Denning, the great British judge, suicide is not against the law. So why is it against the law to help somebody do something which is not against the law? It needs to be justified. Um, and the justification produced by the opponents of it is, well, firstly, well, people, maybe they're depressed and they'll change their mind, but you easily get that, run that problem with the standard safeguards of independent doctors. They may or may not be psychiatrists, they can be nurses, who independently assess whether the patient is in a sound state of mind or not. Not that difficult to do. Uh, and then the other argument produced by the anti-assisted dying people, which is, very much in this country, a, a group of palliative care doctors, is they say these patients, dying patients, are very vulnerable. To which I say, well, vulnerable to what? I suppose somehow it's a feeling that, um, you know, doctors and nurses are terribly keen to kill patients. <laughs> and their patients be vulnerable if they're dying or very, or suffering from intolerable suffering that they will be vulnerable to the suggestion that maybe they want to kill themselves. This strikes me as, as nonsense. Um, we trust doctors and nurses at the moment. Why should we suddenly stop trusting them if assisted dying is available? And given that assisted dying in its various forms is available now in many countries, we have evidence that it, on the whole, it works. It has not led to a sort of terrible outbreak of, of, of many people dying before they want to because they're vulnerable. So it makes these arguments against it make no 
no sense to me at all. But having said that, it's very difficult. I think as a doctor, as most doctors, we are probably more realistic than many people about the inevitability of death because we deal with it all the time in our day-to-day -day work. But having said that, we all find it terribly difficult to think about our death. One thinks about it a little bit and then you go away and think about something else. It, it is difficult, very difficult. Thank you. I'm very sorry to hear about your friend. Well, such is life. Yeah, but still sorry to hear that. And the, my next um, topic is actually how in your books you really exude this love for nature as a backdrop to life. And you clearly have a very keen eye for nature and a vivid description, for example, a flock of birds um, become uh, like a handful of leaves flung into the sky. Um, per perhaps you could tell us a little bit how, about how reassuring the continuity of nature affected your ability to address the life and death decisions that you faced on a daily basis. Well, again, there's a funny paradox here, but it's only when we're dying, if we're lucky enough to go to a hospice, that mm -hmm. suddenly we can have nature and gardens around us. Mm -hmm. I, I always felt very deeply that you know we should have nature in hospitals not just when we're dying mm -hmm. and if you ask me what i am proudest of in my medical career it's not actually having pioneered a few clever technical operations or the various lives i saved because actually if i hadn't done that somebody else would have done it what was more unusual was in the new hospital uh, if I'm, if I'm somewhat second-rate mediocre building I was moved to almost 20 years ago, sort of by mistake, there was a large balcony outside the two neurosurgical wards. It was a mistake because originally the, the planners were going to make the hospital bigger and then they cut bits off. Mm -hmm. And dare I say, purely through my efforts and raising a lot of money charitably, we turned those balconies into roof garden, a wow. roof garden, a really beautiful roof garden. And I can't tell you how popular it's been with both patients and staff. And just recently I heard that all the staff who were you know, getting exhausted treating with the, the COVID crisis found great solace in being able to go and sit in the garden. And again, it's just like we find it difficult to think about death. I think the people who design hospitals and doctors as well, just don't like to think about the reality of being ill, being in hospital. Mm. Um, and nature, we all know nature is incredibly important to all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's, quite, it's hard to do proper controlled clinical trials. But there is lots of evidence that exposure to living plants and green things or lowers your blood pressure and makes you feel mm -hmm. better. Maybe it doesn't make you feel longer, but it improves the quality of your life. Um, and so in, in my books, I've always tended to weave in my, my, my passion for nature as well. Yeah, yeah, it's very clear. It comes um, through very clear. When but I think we all feel that. We all feel that way. Yeah. I mean, as a, I'm not been reading about Beethoven of late because I'm supposed to be doing a program on Radio Three about his illnesses. And he composed a lot of his best. He'd love going for long country walks with a notebook in his pocket, you know, writing down all his musical ideas all the time as he walked. Um, yeah. It, it does make sense because it's also so common to bring plants or flowers to someone who is in hospital. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's all about, you know, I don't want to get mystical about it, but it's about the life force, growing life, you know, things like that. And, and when we're ill in hospital, and especially when we're dying in hospices, we, we get such solace from seeing the natural world. Mm. Because what's so sad now is what the climate change, you know, <laughs> We don't know what's what's going to happen. Hmm. Um, all the bets are off. <clears throat> yeah. There is uh, another thing that quite struck me when reading, uh, especially uh, "Do No Harm," and it is how candidly you speak about dying and and your fear of it. And I wonder, having been faced with life and death situations so frequently, how do you think your role has affected how you face death? It's one of those questions I don't think any of us know until we mm -hmm. faced it. 
Yeah. On the whole, I, I think I, I was, I've always been a bit of an anxious hypochondriac and I was terrified of becoming a patient myself. But when I've had to be a patient, as we get older, the wheels start dropping off. I mean, nothing serious. Well, retinal detachments are serious. And that's basically it. So anyway, I've been a patient now a few times and had operations. And I found it remarkably easy, much to my surprise. Uh, I coped much, much better than I expected. But I kept on telling my, I, I didn't have to tell myself very much. You know, what I am going through is nothing compared to what my patients with brain tumors had to go through. Mm -hmm. So I thought, actually, I'm very lucky that with these health problems, although the retinal detachments were a potential threat to my career, because I was still working at the time. In fact, it all went very well. Um, so, but when, when as, as I first get a really serious illness, I, I don't know how I'll cope. Better than I fear, I hope. Okay, so um, there is often now it seems to be a bit of like two visions of what it means to be a doctor with some thinking that it's the doctor's role to prolong life yeah. and others thinking it's more about relieving a patient's suffering. So, well, for me, for me primarily it's about yeah. reducing suffering mm. because modern medicine now um, we don't cure illnesses on the whole. I mean, we've cured all the curable illnesses. So in, in the developed world, most medicine is directed towards prolonging life. Mm -hmm. And the question then becomes on well, a quality of life. There's no point mm -hmm. prolonging somebody's life if the time they have, if, if the extra time they have is, is wretched. And this comes back to the problem of my friend with radiation and his brain tumour. Mm -hmm. um, so I always felt it's it's... It's primarily about relieving suffering. But then, of course, by helping somebody live longer, if it's a good quality of life, you are relieving, you are relieving suffering. I mean, the problem we all face as doctors is finding a balance between being compassionate and being, and being clinically detached. You can't do the work. If, I was always talked about doctors need to be more empathic. Well, the strict meaning of the word empathy is to actually feel what somebody else feels and mm. you, you couldn't do the work mm. i mean my son had a brain tumor when he was a baby we were very lucky he's yeah, fine many years later and sometimes people ask me did you do the operation yourself and i said no i couldn't do it i mean i've occasionally had to operate upon people i know in person which i always try to avoid i always try to avoid doing just like doctors hate operating on colleagues mm. because of our sort of professional detachment Mm -hmm. breaks down we have to defend ourselves but to get that balance right is difficult and we all have some colleagues who become too detached and callous and, and others who can't cope with the work because they get too involved mm -hmm. and with some patients you achieve it better than with others on the whole as you get older and more senior and more confident it becomes easier i think to find that balance but I think medicine, yeah, for me, medicine was, and still is, I still do some work, it is about reducing suffering. There's this obsession in some areas of modern life, particularly in, in Silicon Valley if, and, and the transhumanists, but it's all about living as long as possible. Well, I don't want to live in a long life. I mean, by the age of 80, we have a 45% probability of getting dementia. By the age of 90, it's that much greater. Um, and the strange idea that the value of life is a question of living extra years, I think is false. I'm beyond my age, I'm 70. I think, you know, the balance between how many extra years you live and quality gets pretty, pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. And the other sad thing about dementia, I watched my father, who was a very, very fine man, a very... It's a very eminent human rights lawyer and pioneer in his field. He became totally demented over about 10 to 15 years. Um, and the trouble is, I remember him in his demented state, memory being what it is. Mm. Whereas my mother, who died at the, at the age of 82, died in full possession of her faculties. And I remember her in a, in a much sort of nicer way. And I, I want to be remembered by my family 
in, in, in a relatively good condition rather than being some demented old wreck in a, in a care home. But having said that, of course, the problem of dementia and assisted dying is a very, very complicated one. Mm. Is what I think concerns most of my friends, my age, what we're all, most of us have had demented parents mm. to look after or to fail to look after to a greater or lesser extent. But of course, you can only, and intolerable, the prospect of dementia um, would count as incurable suffering, certainly. Mm -hmm. In Holland and Belgium and Switzerland, you can have assisted dying on those grounds. I think in Canada, it's not quite yet established in law. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, if you have, you obviously have to have mental capacity um, to decide that. And I know a few, a few English people, mainly doctors, I gather, have gone to Dignitas and Zurich on these grounds. But it means, of course, you're forced to 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 die, maybe before you're quite ready for it, in the sense that once you've lost mental capacity, you may still be enjoying your life to some extent. It is too late. And I know I didn't know what happened. There was a case in Holland recently, a legal case, where a doctor was being um, prosecuted for having carried out assisted dying on a woman who was profoundly demented, but had it opted for assisted dying when she still had mental capacity. So I think that's, I think that's very difficult, um, but it's a problem we need to address because you know, the, the demographic revolution or the demographic crisis really going on in the modern world is the number of older people in society is going up and up and up and a significantly large proportion of those will be, suffer from severe dementia. And none of them probably in their pre-demented state would want to exist in a demented state, mm. or very few people. Yeah, it, it, it is a very tough uh, topic when you're mm. um, connecting it to dementia. One of my best friends is 89 years old, he's about to turn 90 and, and he's blind, but we go to a lot of concerts together. Yeah. And I think um, it's all about having that choice, you know, when you feel that it, it's your time yeah. and, uh, um, yeah, because every case is different, but it's all about the freedom to, to be able and to... It's all, and it's all yeah. about probabilities, and that's one of mm. the problems in medical practice as doctors. We, don't, we never know what will happen to an individual patient. Mm. We only say, well, if we had 100 patients like you, X percent would happen and Y percent that. Actually, mm. the same problem as with the A-level exam fiasco. The algorithm was a good way of predicting the overall results, but does not predict what will happen to the individual. And as a result, great injustice was done mm -hmm. to, to bright kids and disadvantaged schools. And that was all because it was thinking algorithmically rather than in individual cases. Yeah, yeah it's so important to see the individual and it, that's really what assisted dying is so, about. Yes, and we have to, we have to make a as rational a decision as we can, given the probabilities. Um, my own feeling at the moment is, if I felt, I mean, obviously by the age of 70, my memory is not what it is. You know, I keep on walking into a room and thinking, why, why am I here? What do I want to do? That isn't, that isn't Alzheimer's yet. Mm -hmm. But I've had a brain scan now for a I, had a, I have that too, so... <laughs> well, I've had a brain scan for a research project, and it was pretty horrible. I mean, I've spent all my life looking at brain scans, mm. but my brain looked pretty awful. I mean, I, I can still think that I'm writing about my brain scan now. But it felt like the writing on the wall, whether the changes I saw, not just the atrophy, but something called white matter hyperintensities, is mm. not clear whether they predict dementia or not, but they might. You know. mm. But then I might die from something else beforehand, if I'm lucky, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, this is the other problem. We have to try to think about death as in terms of what the economists call opportunity cost. You know, if you die, you know, it's, it was, I was thinking most recently that the great guitarist Julian Bream died a few days ago. I think in his late 80s or early 90s. And it was so sad, such a tragic loss. Well, we really think about death in the wrong way. We're wired by evolution to think that death is a bad thing. It is not if you reach three score years and 10, if you had a successful life and you've been a good parent and you have children who still love you and you're proud of, 
it is to be celebrated if we die quickly and cleanly, mm. not drawn out in, 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 with much suffering and lots mm. of medical treatment. So, you know, it is, it's conventional. Our thoughts are with the family and loved ones and all these pious phrases. But I think if somebody lives into a reasonable old age and has had a good life, their death is to be celebrated. We, we, we shouldn't live forever. It's greedy. You know, why do these transhumanists in California want to clutter up the planet with lots of terribly old people? It strikes me as wrong. Um, you know, the future is to be young people uh, and making a good future for the young, not um, prolonging, <laughs> prolonging the lives of old people like myself. This may not go down very well with some people, but I think one has to... I hope you will stay with us for much longer. <laughs> well, so do I, you know, within reason. But, well, but having said that, I don't know what my decision making would be. Yeah. Because I realise, I often think about this, and I think, well, when the time comes, I want to get it over with. But I realise there's also still the sneaky idea that somehow I'll start all over again, you know, but it's, but death is not, not final. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't believe for a moment in any sort of afterlife. Um, I think as a, with any basic understanding of neuroscience, you can't. I mean, and again, having seen so many people in my working life with damaged brains, you really can't believe, I mean, particularly with personality change, you can't for a moment believe in any sort of afterlife. Um, fascinating, and I, just like many people with the onset of COVID, I read the famous 17th century English book, Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. And he describes people dying, often very horribly, it was a horrible illness, saying, you know, it's all, you know, telling others, you must repent now, you know, you must not leave repentance until the last moment. Because until the modern secular age, most people really were terrified of what, in, in Christian countries, they were terrified of hell. They were really frightened of what happened after death. You know, the old line from Hamlet, the, that un country from which no from which burn no travellers ever return. But we don't have that, and we don't have to worry about what happens to us after we've died. All we have to worry about is how we die. And that is what assisted dying is about. It's trying to improve, for many of us, the way we die. Obviously, some people have strokes and heart attacks and keel over and die in, in, in what's really rather a nice way. They're not so nice with a family. Um, but that's what assisted dying is about. And it's certainly not as is strongly implied by its opponents. Um, but it's about licensing doctors to kill patients. So I was talking a couple of years ago to a very senior former Conservative Party cabinet minister, and I was talking about the importance of assisted dying. They said, oh no, no, we can't do that. You know, we again have debt lists and we'll have targets for dying. It's complete mm. rubbish. Mm. Absolute rubbish. Yeah, um, and yeah, you always hear some very irrational um, counter arguments for yeah. us to die. And um, I think we're now at the end, uh, um, the part of the the okay. call where we will have some uh, questions from yep. the audience as well. And the, I, there were so many pre-submitted ones, so. We would be up all night if you were going to answer all of them. Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> we will, we will uh, keep the time in mind for okay. us. <laughs> so the first one is um, in your book, Admissions, you ask the rhetorical question, what do you say to somebody who is completely paralyzed yeah. from the neck down, but on a ventilator and awake, uh, yeah. but therefore unable to talk? And um, this brings to mind the case of the late Tony Nicholson and yes. Hockton syndrome and um, I brought a case unsuccessfully against the government mm -hmm. to help allow him to die and uh, this will link with a question that is submitted by Susanna who will yeah. now uh, join us and ask you. Hi. Um, Maybe if it's... Well, shall I answer the question if... if I, have, I have the question. If it's not working, I will ask it. So the question is, do you think it should be part of our human rights to have the option in principle of a medically assisted death? 
Yes, I do. I do very, I do very strongly indeed. It has to be subject to safeguards. You know, some some suicidal people are, are, are depressed, mm -hmm. um, and they are treatable, and it can be reversed, obviously. Um, but that is easily assessed. Um, I don't I don't see that as being a, a problem at all. As to talking to people who are totally paralyzed, I, I speak from the perspective of a hospital doctor where you're busy and, and rushing around. And the only way you can communicate with these poor people is with a, a letter board and eye blinking. It mm. takes a very, very long time. And it's all too easy to find an excuse to hurry by and say, I haven't got time. But you always feel, I always felt terribly bad about it. Mm. Um. Yeah, so I think we will try for the next audience member to ask uh, the yeah. question and we will t hopefully it will work this time, but... I think I've got to work. Um, sorry, my computer keeps freezing. Give me a second. Um, so do you think that... Uh, sorry, do you get the impression that uh, doctors are afraid to voice the support for assisted dying? They certainly, they certainly are in the palliative care community, and a group of them wrote anonymously, I think to the BMJ recently, saying, making exactly that point. And the BMA, which I never belonged to, um, has refused to publish the results of a survey, because clearly the, member of the, the members of the council are all paid up opponents to assisted dying. Doctors, I, I, I mean, <laughs> If you talk to doctors privately, at least ones I do, my colleagues and friends, we all think assisted dying is, is a reasonable, good idea. But I think people feel, oh, they, as doctors feel awkward about saying this in public, because they feel that somehow people will feel they're not committed to keeping them alive. I think it's a false anxiety. As if you talk honestly with patients and their families, and given, as Trevor said at the beginning, there is such clear evidence from opinion polls that the great majority of people in this country are in favour of it. But it's difficult, as I said earlier, it's always difficult to think about death, it's difficult to talk about death. I was very struck when my mother was dying, because my sister, who's a nurse, and I did the palliative care. Neither of us, and my mother was very totally compassmented, and she was discussing her funeral and arrangements. But none of us could actually use the word die. Um, sort of more, we came up with all euphemisms like when you're not here, just like in public discourse, people are talking about passing, which I find very irritating. But talking to patients when I was trying to, and families, it's, I, I also, I would try to use the word die or death, but it always sort of stuck in my throat. It was always difficult. Maybe that's right. Maybe that's how it should be. But it's terribly easy to, to lapse into euphemisms or complicated talk and walk out of the room. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Thank you, um, the other Sarah. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, there is one other question I, I want, uh, that has been submitted by, by someone beforehand, but I will ask it. And it's if you think that the nature of the assisted dying debate has changed since over the years that you have been a doctor and like since you became yes i, I think it has yeah. i mean again it's hard to judge it's hard to judge these things but i, I think it's very much like gay marriage mm. it, it, it's um it'll come it'll it'll be slow in this country because this country is slow and conservative and has a terrible terrible press terrible newspapers with a few exceptions you remember a few years ago, there was a big row about the Liverpool Care Pathway, which basically was a, was a um, pathway for treating terminally ill patients, subject to the English fudge about when you use high-dose heroin. Yes, it's to, it's to, to ease symptoms, but also, in fact, we know it will probably hasten the patient's death as well. I think one of, them, one of the tabloids had a big campaign against it because various families are complaining. But when you actually looked at it, the problem was that the care pathway was not being used properly. The critical, one of the critical points about it was that you should have a detailed conversation with the family and the patient about what was going on. And this was 
hadn't hadn't happened. And again, I think one of the strong, one of the many strong arguments for assisted dying is that at the moment, doctors can't have an honest and open conversation with patients and their families about how they, how their life is going to end. They have to use lots of euphemisms. Yes, obviously, it's you know palliative care at the end involves using high doses of heroin in in many cases, mm -hmm. and this is used deliberately to bring the patient's life to an end. But nobody will admit that. Just like in the past, until Harold Shipman, many doctors um, actually carried out assisted dying. But you couldn't talk about it openly. So it was actually worse than if it was, assisted dying was available. You have euthanasia without consent. It also meant because there was no clear discussion you could have a few doctors, there was one down on the south coast recently, who clearly was abusing it. Not in the way Harold, Harold Shipman was a, was a psychopath and a mass murderer. But the fact is all left so vague and unclear will encourage a few doctors to, to use terminal care as a way of killing patients without proper open discussion with the family. I think actually it's one of the strongest pragmatic arguments for assisted dying. Mm. I've never seen the debate argued from that point of view before. Um, we have another question also from, from a doctor, and it's Dr. Miriam Day. So if Kieran will bring her up, she can ask her question. Oh. Hello? Hello. Hi. Sorry. I'm, um, I'm Miriam, I'm a doctor, I'm afraid that I'm working in Wales at the moment. Well, you don't have to apologise for it. <laughs> and I think as you say... I love like, Wales, I love Midwest, Midwest. So all, almost without exception, as you've already said, our colleagues support assisted dying yep. and something that they'd want for themselves. Yes. But it's how, if you've got any ideas of how we can get these people to be honest and open and support something or support a need for the change in the law without worrying about them compromising their own career. And I know specifically some very um, outspoken people in the Wales area about assisted dying and specifically people in palliative care. Yeah. But it's... We need to name names, yes. There's one particular person, yes. Yeah, and, and especially younger people in the career. So I think once you get to the more mm. senior la layers of your career, and especially people that yes. are retired, you can say yeah. what you want. It's not going to affect your career, but it's... I mean, it, it, it's a very good question. It's not going to come via the BMA. That much is clear. Um, yeah. And I suppose it's something MDMD needs to think about, whether we should try to canvas, canvas the medical profession. It could be done anonymously. Because um, I, I think there was a register in Victoria and Australia, they had a sort of register of if yes. you change the law, and it's whether you think that might be something worth pursuing with people in... in I, think, I think that's something MDM do we ought to think about, actually. I think it would be very... I know in America, the, the American Physicians Association has now come out in favour of assisted dying, or at least being in favour of it. And in this country, the... I think the Royal College of Physicians is neutral. And the whole point is it, it shouldn't be up to doctors. I mean, it's really about us as patients. Why, why is it up to doctors to decide how, think, how we live our lives? I mean, that's I think terribly patronising. Yeah, I think interestingly, those of us that work in surgical specialties, yeah. it's completely logical. Because yeah. we have discussions with people all the time and we give them the information and they make their decision. Yes. Yeah. So death becomes no different compared no, exactly. to what you're talking about. It should not be any different. And I said, but you, because it's against the law, we, we yeah. cannot have open discussions about it, which I think is terrible. Mm. Um, no, but it's something I'll, I'll think about that. I mean, but I, I, I met, um, is it Ronald Syme, the, the, the doctor in Australia and Victoria, who was one of the forces for the introduction of assisted dying in, in Victoria. He's a nice chap. He, he, he said he got so many requests from patients who were desperate to die. He got barbiturates from a vet, veterinary friend and, and gave them, you know, and that started the ball, started the ball rolling, which was quite brave of him in a way. He was yeah. breaking the law and he got into trouble over it. No, I think, I think it would be very helpful if, if there was some kind of 
survey of a large number of doctors showing how many people supported it. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about that with Trevor and Co. Okay. Thank I said you. the BMA won't do it. <laughs> that much is seen from the same hymn sheet with regards to that. Yeah, is exactly. it? <laughs> mm. Okay. Thank you. I would like probably um, to for Claire to say a few words. Um, so, Claire, if you would join me. Yeah. The question I'd like to put to Henry, if he can uh, hear us or when he gets back, is um, how can we persuade Parliament, because that's where the, 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 the logjam is, how mm. can we persuade Parliament that this is an issue about compassion? It's about reducing suffering and um, caring for people. How can we get that message across? The question about Parliament is a very interesting one. I, I did actually read the Hansard, the official transcript of a debate, what it was for, three or four years ago, which rejected assisted dying. It was absolutely appalling. Um, literally lies were being spoken by some of the members of Parliament, saying that the drugs used for assisted dying cause great suffering. Complete bollocks. Hmm. So it was a very, very unimpressive debate. Now, since then, of course, Parliament has largely changed, but I have no idea what the new, new cohort of MPs is like. Um, and I think, you know, we, we all need to write to our MPs. Um, MD, MD needs mm. to campaign over this. It's the only mm. thing MPs respond to. Um, but it is a problem. And it is very odd that this is something where the MPs are completely out of step with, with public opinion. And I, I don't quite know why that should be the case. And do you think that when, if, or when hopefully the law does change, how do we ensure that the control remains with the patient? Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way that the legislation is drafted. And we obviously look, you look to countries like Canada <clears throat> and see the way they set things up. And because we have a common law system in this country, you know, the, presumably there might be some legal cases trying to sort out some of the, some of the problems of it. But I don't, I don't see where that should be a problem. And the fact of the matter is assisted dying has been available in, in Holland and Belgium and Switzerland, in Japan actually. No, for many, many years, and it seems to function reasonably, reasonably well on the whole, mm. as far as one can tell. So uh, I think the opposition to it is, is pretty irrational, but we have to deal with it. Mm. And the next question is from an audience member named David. So Kieran is going to bring him up now. There. Just if you unmute yourself, uh, we should be able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, fine, fine. perfect. Thank good, you. Good evening. Um, as you know, uh, uh, Dr. Marsh, uh, My Death, My Decision campaigns for a law that will not only aid the incurably suffering, but also the terminally ill. Yes. Without any arbitrary six months time limit, yes. which for instance they had in Oregon, and which is so strongly supported of my dignity in dying. My question to you is this, do you think MDMD's wider goal will cause the case for an assisted dying law to be weakened amongst, do amongst doctors, especially amongst politicians? Well, this, this, I think, is why dignity and dying have gone for the Oregon, the Oregon option, <clears throat> because um, they, fe they feel that it's a step too far to extend it to incurable suffering. Um, I mean, I, I don't know the honest answer is. It's a question of strategy and politics. It seems to me, but just in terms of consistency and coherence, it does not make sense to have assisted dying only if you're probably going to die within six months. Mm -hmm. And that will miss many, I think, of the most serious cases. Yes. And the evidence for what it's worth from Oregon is that many people, when they go into 
palliative care express an interest in, in assisted dying, but when the end comes, or comes nearer, they, they don't take it up. And I've certainly seen this several times with medical families I know, where the medical parent said to the medical son or daughter, you know, when my time comes, I want you to help me reach the end with dignity. But in the event, when they fell ill, with several cases of cancer, they, they no longer talked about it. And I watched that as well as in my mother, who developed what's called cognitive dissonance. Part of her knew she was dying, part of her talked as though she wasn't. Um, and this is a very, quite a common phenomenon when we reach the end of our life. I think the much more demanding and serious cases are the ones of incurable suffering. People with MND, conditions like that, again, early dementia. Um, so I think we just need to, my own feeling is we need to stick to our guns and make a rational case for it by compromising over six months, I think, actually, in a sense, one weakens the case. Well, I'm well aware of the fact the opponents of assisted dying in its Oregon form say, oh, it's a slippery slope, you know, if we agree to this, then we'll have assisted dying just on the grounds of any suffering, which of course is a gross, gross distortion of the truth. But it, it's a question of politics and tactics. I don't know, but I've, I've, I back the more comprehensive solution rather than the six months only one. Mm. Yeah, it's almost to say that you have to suffer first, but... What is that? And, yeah. and also for a doctor to know, you can't know precisely. And of course, yeah, six months is, yeah. is one of the criticisms that the opponent yeah. says. You, you never know when somebody's going to die until yeah. a few days away. Yeah. So it was six months. And why six months? Why not five months? Why not nine months? You know, it's, yeah. it doesn't make... We're talking about reducing suffering, not about, you know, six months' time. Yeah. Well, we have a few more audience questions. I'm hoping that we get uh, to go through some more of them before we have to let go of you. So the first one up is Sam. And let's see. Yeah, he's already ready. Great. Welcome, Sam. Hi, uh, Dr. Hello. Marsh. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a really interesting talk. Um, I wondered, uh, what do you think the best argument against assisted dying is? And what would you respond to that argument? How would you counter it? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Uh, I haven't thought about that before. Um, I suppose it would be that if in a very stretched healthcare system and you have loads and loads of older people in, in a poor condition that um, they'll be treated badly and so they'll want to die because they're not, got it, they're not getting good quality care. Now, again, the evidence is from countries where assisted dying is available is that it does not re replace hospice treatment. It doesn't actually reduce the quality of hospice care. Mm. Um, but in theory, you know, if, if the NHS is always short of money because it's tax funded and none of us want to, what well, the politicians don't want to ask us to pay more taxes because they're worried they'll lose the election, um, which is understandable. Um, if, if you had a very stretched care health system, I suppose one might be worried that people were, were suffering more than necessary and therefore more of them were opting for suicide. Mm. That, that I think is probably the main, main practical argument I can think of. The solution to that, of course, is that we should have reasonably good quality of care anyway, although it is expensive. Mm. I can't think of any other arguments off the off the top of my head. Mm. And in terms of abuse by the Harold Shipmans of this world, well, that's less likely to happen because you have independent assessors and the whole thing is in the open and discussed openly. So I, I think it would be less likely to be abused by rogue doctors than, than the present situation. Yeah, it, it um, brings the point that you mentioned earlier about how when- Transparency. It's laws yeah. and control around yeah. uh, surrounded it and openness about it it's, it's mu much easier to for it to be done properly and for exactly. yeah. Yeah. so we have um, one more audience question now and it's uh, from Carrie uh, from 
she asked in the Q and A here earlier. Kerry hints. Yes, there she is. If you unmute yourself. Hello, Henry. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, my question is from when I remember being a student and talking to other medical students, my feeling was that they were 100% focused on saving lives. Is the concept of dying well now included in medical students, um, what they're learning at, uh, during their undergraduate years? I've had very little contact in recent years of medical student teaching, so the honest answer is I don't know the answer to that. I think certainly palliative care is now taught um, in medical schools, um, but I suspect it'll have a rather anti-assisted dying flavour if it is. Inevitably, when you're a young doctor, you think you're going to save the world, save lots of lives. Um, and again, when you're young, you think you're invulnerable. Death is very your own death and illness is very, very remote from you. So um, I think it's very important for senior doctors to set an example for young doctors and medical students to, to think about these things. Is the old you need to put yourself in the patient's position and that's a question of teaching. But by the very nature of starting your medical career, particularly in surgery, you see it really is there's so much technical stuff you have to learn. You do rather tend to put the what, what was called the touchy-feely stuff to one side. Um, on the whole, these are things doctors don't talk about very much among themselves, because I had the rather unusual experience <clears throat> right at the beginning of my career of having a son with a brain tumour who almost died. I, I'm not saying I would have been a... Well, I don't know, but I think it probably made me a better doctor. And, and one of the problems of healthcare is so much of it is dealt out by fit, healthy young doctors and nurses who don't really understand what it's like to be ill and old, stuck in hospital. My, my second wife was Crohn's disease and she's also a, a highly intelligent um, anthropologist and a very successful best-selling author. Um, and she even, and I mean, we met 20 years ago, but I really was well into my medical career by then. But really, it, she really point made me realize just what horrible places hospitals are, um, how demeaning, and personal, humiliating they are. And again, that applies to the dying. You know, we do tend to push the dying to one side, and it should be a very important part of medical education. Whether it is or not, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I hope it is. Thank you for that. Um, I'm looking because there's been quite a few questions also in the Q&A, so I'm trying to see if we might have time for one more. Um, um, let's see. Kieran. Yeah, so Phil has asked a question. Um, do, I'm not sure if we're bringing him up or if I'm going to ask it. I think I will read it. So, um, in the preface of your book, Admissions, you talk about your suicide kit. Yes. Mm -hmm. And under what circumstances might you use it? Um, incurable, incurable pain, early stage dementia, depression, when the lack of energy and dwindling physical ability or of increasing age makes you feel you have completed life. It's a tough question, but... But yeah, it's, again, I mean, it's it's a it's a question you only know the answer to as as it life there, yeah. as life unfolds. Mm. Um, as many people have a horror of going into a care home, mm. but then of course the irony is if the self-respecting bits of my brain have rotted, I might not mind. You know, I might be happy to be a doddery old fool in a care home, and this is the great paradox. If you get you have to get out in advance, and when is the, when is the right time? <laughs> It'd be easy. I mean, yes, if, if I had a very disabling stroke, I, I think it's very unlikely being the person I am, but I would accept that. If I couldn't get around on my own, mm. I didn't, if I couldn't go on making things and doing things all the time, I suspect I'd become very depressed, and I'd say, I don't want to live like this. If I had some... The neurone disease, um, 
I think I'd feel well until, you know, it just becomes so tedious and unpleasant having difficulty, difficulty eating and, and things like that. Um, one has, there are so many ways of dying, there are so many ways of suffering, one has to each take each one on its merits, is the answer. Mm. But I hope, I hope, I would like to think if I don't have a quick, easy, sudden death, I would like to think I'll do away with myself at the right time. Mm. But then I have to think about my family, my children, my granddaughters, you know, yeah. no man is an island. Um, I, I'm very, I have a very good relationship, I think, with my family. And, and suicide, of course, in some ways, is a very selfish act. Uh, and you have to persuade your family and the people you love and who love you that this is the right thing for you. And that's a separate, another problem. Yeah. And even in regards to assisted dying, it's often maybe <clears> the <throat> family around the people who love a person who is sick that might or be... Or opposed to it. Exactly. It can be. You, it, there's all sorts of complicated yeah, politics. It's involved. not often that the family yeah. wants um, yeah. someone to do it, but then again, they will respect that the person wants... But all, but all the more reason to have an open, to have mm -hmm. open, open and mm -hmm. honest discussion. Yeah, it's, it's so important to, to think about and talk about these things. Yeah. In this country it's all brushed under the English yeah. carpet, you know. Really so grateful that you spent your evening with yes, us. Really. That's all right. it, it's been yeah. Zoom just about worked. <laughs> yeah, we managed in the end, didn't yeah. we? And I think Trevor would Trevor will join us again and close up the meeting. So thank okay. you so much. Bye everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I can only echo what Sarah says, Henry. Thank you so much. Uh, really greatly appreciated. And uh, you have a quote at the beginning of uh, admissions from Michel de Montaigne, uh, of whom I'm a great fan, about being booted and spurred and ready that's to right. go. Yeah. Let's hope that's not for quite some time yet. We'll see. Um, just picking up on one of the things you said um, about writing to MPs, on uh, the My Death, My Decision website, we do have a campaign toolkit which has advice on how best to approach your MP. And a really good thing to try and achieve is actually a constituency meeting uh, with, with your MP, but it also has advice on the type of letter to write and so on. So I'd encourage everyone to visit the website to, to look at that. Um, just before we close, uh, apologies obviously for the technology, which was, as they say, beyond our control. But I'm so relieved that um, at 18.15 we didn't seem to have any link at all and, and uh, mercifully we were able to, to run it and I hope you uh, uh, could all cope with the, with the temporary intermission. We will, as I say, be recording the event and uh, it'll be placed on our YouTube channel for you to uh, hear what Henry said again because I found there was so much rich material in there that I'd certainly like to to listen to it again. Thank you all so much for joining. Uh, I just echo what I said at the beginning about uh, uh, My Death, My Decision being dependent on uh, volunteers and uh, funding from donors and so on. So if you are minded to join us, do visit the website and click on the join donate button and hope we'll see you all soon at another My Death, My Decision event. Thank you for joining us and thank you Henry again. My pleasure. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Good night.